Welcome to this week's video briefing. When we talk about Europe, as we do frequently on these occasions, the country most at our forefront of our thinking is Greece, or possibly Spain, or possibly Italy. Well, today it's neither of those, it's the United Kingdom. I'm going to talk to Stephanie Hare about the vexed issue of the United Kingdom's relationship with the European Union. And we're encouraged to do so, Steph, because the US official responsible for European affairs has made an intervention which has caught the imagination and the headlines in the UK and rather further afield. What has he said and why? That's right. This is Philip H. Gordon that you're talking about, who's the highest official here talking on behalf of the U.S. State Department, saying that he wants to see the United United Kingdom remain part of the European Union um, and that this is very important for American interests. And the timing of these remarks is rather significant because we've got a rather big speech coming from the prime minister in the next, well, practically uh, a few days. That's right. UK Prime Minister David Cameron has long trailed this this speech, which he's going to be making in the Netherlands by the end of January, talking about and really setting out his plans to reform the UK relationship with the European Union. Mm. Now, this could take the form of repatriating some powers from Brussels back to London, or it could be something as extreme as a complete exit from the European Union. Now, either of these options would most likely have to be put forth to the British public in a referendum. Mm. And a referendum to be undertaken when and what kind of question would be asked. These are two rather significant dimensions to this. Well, he's most likely not going to want to do that in the terms of this parliament. We must remember that the general election is most likely going to be held in 2015. There's another referendum that needs to take place first, and that's on whether or not Scotland will choose to separate from the United Kingdom. So that might be something that he'd like to get out of the way. Mm. Therefore, it's most likely that he'll push to have it in this, the next parliament, probably around 2018, we're thinking. But again, this depends on whether or not his party, the Conservatives, are re-elected, which is by no means a foregone conclusion. The repatriation dimension is worth exploring just a little bit and to understand at what kind of resting place the United Kingdom might be able to find itself uh, and still be inside the EU, what it can sign up for, what its partners, the EU members, will tolerate as far as uh, the UK is concerned. Yes, I mean, that's really the striking thing about both Scotland's demands and then the United Kingdom's demands towards the European Union is they seem to have this this idea, they're operating under the impression that the European Union is an a la carte menu from which they can pick and choose. And what we've seen in recent months, uh, in increasingly strident tones, is these EU, EU member states saying no, It's not an a la carte menu. You're either in or you're out. And that might take the shape of the question that could be asked in the referendum is literally, do you want to be in the European Union or on your own? I don't know really how much goodwill there is among the other EU member states at this point to allow Britain, for instance, to have its own version of being a member state. Um, It's already it's already got many provisions that it's opted out of. But really what what we're talking about now is something really different, a really fundamental shift. Let's talk about the United States dimension again, because the relationship between London and Washington has always been very important, especially to London, and also on occasion to Washington. And presumably, um, it was the benefits of the relationship that um, the US Assistant Secretary had in mind when he made his remarks. There's a bigger picture here, though, on the commercial front, on the trade front, which Um, may or may not, after a passage of time, result in a free trade agreement of real substance and significance. That's right. I mean, Mr. Gordon was very clear that this this discussion of the EU uh, relationship would by no means affect US-UK collaboration in terms of military or intelligence work. That partnership will remain very close. But the sign that he was sending was something that was very interesting and perhaps underestimated by the UK government and indeed even Cameron himself which is that on economic affairs, the United States would prefer to negotiate with the European Union as a bloc, mm-hmm. not have to do bilateral trade relationships with each member state. That's the whole point of the European Union is that it's, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that may have been something that Cameron missed, a nuance that he may have to add back in to recalibrate because he himself is in favor of an EU-US tr- uh, free trade agreement. And that's something that we're seeing talks starting 
on this year, it would be incredibly exciting because right now we're seeing it's very difficult to generate growth in the individual European countries. So what the European Union has been doing is signing these bilateral free trade agreements. They just concluded one with Singapore before the year end. They're in talks with Canada and possibly in talks with Japan. One with the United States would be a real coup and a way to generate growth in an, an economy that's otherwise very uncertain. We're not really sure where growth is coming from. So the UK would not want to miss out on this. Let's talk finally, if we may, just briefly about the constituencies in the United Kingdom itself. We know a lot about Euroscepticism. We know a lot about the importance of that in the Conservative Party. But outside of those confines of politics, in business, in the city, there are voices which presumably will speak up when the debate intensifies about the merits of membership, if not the exact precise forms membership should take. It's true because we've seen really that the UK business community have been strangely quiet on this point, but they roused themselves from their holiday slumber this week. We saw 10 major UK business leaders come out and publish a letter in the Financial Times arguing about the importance of the EU membership for the United Kingdom. Now, they are entirely on side about reforming, for instance, the EU budget, um, improving the single markets functioning but they don't want a referendum and they don't want an EU exit. I mean, we have to remember the European Union is the biggest single market in the world. It's about 500 million people. Um, it's an incredible achievement. Opting out of that would hurt a lot of UK businesses. I was just reading today that something like one in 10 jobs in the UK are directly uh, affected by this relationship. So this is, this is not something to be toyed with lightly, but really that backlash has only just started. We're really gonna see them making the case gradually now throughout the year. That too could influence the way that Cameron decides to present his case, not just now, but you know, this will be something that will be discussed for years. This is not going to be resolved Good. in the next two months. Thanks, Stephanie. And thank you for watching. The position of the United Kingdom in the European Union is going to be very much at the center of our European analysis during the course of this year. If you'd like access to that, please do contact us via our website. We look forward to hearing from you.